Bonjour et bienvenue à cette conférence de presse. Je suis Elizabeth Thompson de CBC News. Avec nous aujourd'hui, on a le très honorable Richard Wagner, juge en chef du Canada. Avec nous aujourd'hui, nous avons le honorable Richard Wagner, chef de justice du Canada, qui va updater les Canadiens sur le travail de la Supreme Court et répondre aux questions des journalistes. Et comme le juge Wagner parle, peut-être quelqu'un dans la salle qui veut indiquer who wants a question, just raise your hand and I'll start taking names, and then we'll go to the people online. Monsieur Wagner? Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour et merci de vous... Uh de vous joindre à moi aujourd'hui et merci aussi de l'intérêt que vous portez à la Cour suprême du Canada. As always, uh, I look forward to this opportunity to speak with you and answer your questions. Um, there are several ends up. Okay. No, avez-vous une déclaration? Okay. <laughs> avez-vous une déclaration à faire? Do you have a statement? Seulement, on passe directement aux questions. No, no, I've got a statement to, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I was saying that I speak on behalf of the court uh, when I say that we value the important role of the media in informing Canadians with accurate and reliable reports on the law, hearings, trials, and legal issues. This is my fifth annual news conference. I want as many people as possible to understand the role and work of Canada's top court. This is essential in building confidence in our independent and impartial courts. Je compte vous faire part de quelques réflexions. I have a few uh, thoughts to share with you, not Canada, only laquelle, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, which, by the way, is the only bilingual and bilingual Supreme Court in the world. Pays but I also want to share thoughts as Chief Justice of a country plat. which, while not Plus a superpower in the literal sense, can boast of being a superpower in the sense of democratic values, particularly in terms of judicial independence. You, the Supreme Court of Canada is proud to take an active role in this respect, particularly in terms of explaining the court's role as guardian of the Constitution and of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as well as the principle of judicial independence, which is essential in a healthy democracy. C'est dans cet esprit que la Cour suprême publie it maintenant chaque année spirit, un rapport détaillé appelé la rétrospective annuelle a detailed report called the Year in Review, which details its work and activities. It is in the spirit that the court prepares in plain language summaries of the court's judgments, outlining the history of the cases and the basis for the decisions. And it is in the spirit that three years after visiting Winnipeg, the Supreme Court will, for the second time in its history, hear appeals outside Ottawa from September 12th to 16th. The Court will be sitting in Quebec City. The public is invited to attend both hearings, as well as an open house for the nine judges of the Court. Les juges iront aussi, notamment dans neuf écoles secondaires, afin d'y répondre aux questions des jeunes. La Cour a récemment accru the sa présence en ligne en se dotant d'un compte Instagram. Elle y partage des photos et de l'information qui portent souvent sur des activités se déroulant hors de la salle d'audience. Outside the courtroom. Sur mon récent For voyage example, au Sénégal, c'est à l'occasion de mon séjour dans ce pays qui a pris fait mon mandat de trois ans country, en tant que président de l'Association des cours constitutionnels francophones. Ici au Canada, Here in Canada, I also chair the Advisory Council of the Order of Canada, the Canadian Judicial Council, and the National Judicial Institute, which develops and delivers educational programs for judges, both Canadians and foreign. You may be interested to know that the National Judicial Institute recently wrapped up its project supporting judicial reform in Ukraine in partnership with the Office of Canada's Commissioner for Judicial Affairs. Working with their Ukrainian counterparts, Canadian judges offered one-on-one -on -one mentorship and training on judgment writing, gender equality, and managing conflicts of interest. The NGI 
also supported initiatives aimed at improving the process for selecting and appointing judges, as well as improving judicial education and governance structures. When I arrived at the Canadian Judicial Council at its chair in 2017, I reached out to chief, to chief and associate chief justices across Canada to hear their views about the future of the organization. From there, we struck a renewal committee, and I'm proud of its progress. The Council has since published guides for self-represented litigants, developed best practices for judges in case management, and published updated ethical principles for judges. We have also published summaries of all judicial education courses, being accessible and sharing information about how judges continue their professional development is key to upholding confidence in our courts. Safeguarding judicial independence is likewise key in this regard. As you may recall, soon after I became Chief Justice, I undertook to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Minister of Justice back in 2019 to strengthen the administrative independence of the Supreme Court. And just a few weeks ago, I signed two additional memoranda of understanding with the Minister of Justice, the first of which relates to judicial governance and serves to acknowledge that the principle of judicial independence includes the independence of the Council in fulfilling its mandate to serve the public. This MOU also advances transparency by setting out the key provisions relating to funding requests and the essential role of the Council in the appointment of the Commissioner for Federal Judicial Affairs, who is responsible for supporting the Council's operations. The second MOU relates to judicial education and establishes how the Federal Government and the Council engage with one another in this regard, while honoring constitutional boundaries required by judicial independence and the separation of powers. The MOU recognizes that judicial education is an essential element of Canada's justice system, that Canada is an international leader in this field, and that initiatives concerning judicial education must be undertaken in a manner that respects judicial independence and embodies transparency and accountability to the public. Les tribunaux ont un rôle de première heure à jouer dans la mise en œuvre des valeurs de l'État de droit et de nos institutions démocratiques. Par même au Canada, rien n'est acquis. Je mets vertu à rappeler qu'il faut sans cesse demeurer vigilant, sachant que les attaques et les violations à cet égard sont parfois insidieuses et les réactions trop, trop tardives, si réactions il y a. Toutes les parties prenantes du système de justice sont à réévaluer ce qu'elles font, comment elles le font et dans quelle mesure elles répondent efficacement aux besoins des gens qu'elles servent. Nous ne devons ni ne pouvons retourner à la situation telle qu'elle existait avant la pandémie. Notre système de justice doit continuer à se moderniser et à innover. To modernize and to de innovate, devoir, sachant it que is our duty to do justice, so, knowing that access to justice is not just one basic service. right or service, but first and foremost, human. a basic human need, and as such, sens, it is an essential ingredient de la of democracy. I admit it is a big task, especially with so many courts facing backlogs and delays. Citizens expect access to justice in a timely manner. That is why the Action Committee on Court Operations in Response to COVID-19 continues to meet even as the pandemic eases. The Action Committee recently drafted a document for judges and court administrators called the Roadmap to Recovery. The goal is to support courts struggling with delays, backlogs, and managing change. It is full of practical suggestions 
on how to find efficiencies and develop best practices to deal with, ma with matters faster and more effectively. I encourage you to learn more about the roadmap on the website of Canada's Commissioner of Federal Judicial Affairs. Last year, I told you how the court would continue to offer the option to remote, of remote hearings, even after the court reopened. Now, we actively encourage remote hearings. The technology levels the playing field for all, giving parties the option to make their case from wherever they choose, offers substantial savings, especially to those farthest from Ottawa. This improves access to justice, especially for interveners, such as public interest groups that present the court with additional context and perspectives on challenging legal issues. Truly, it does not matter if counsel is standing before them or appearing on screen. Strong, well-reasoned, and persuasive arguments can be made can be made from anywhere. J'ai le plaisir aussi d'annoncer que la Cour suprême est également sur le point d'achever la réalisation d'un projet à long terme de modernisation de ses opérations. Dirigé par l'avocate générale de la Cour, cette modernisation accroît l'accès à la justice à toutes les étapes d'une instance. Par exemple, le recours à de nouveaux processus et moyens technologiques permet d'améliorer l'accès du public à l'information en ligne, notamment les mémoires déposées par les parties, le registre du greffe de la Cour et la web diffusion en direct des audiences. La dernière composante de ce projet de modernisation, qui devrait être en place d'ici la fin de l'année, est un portail, un portail de dépôt électronique sûr et efficace à l'intention des procureurs et des plaideurs non représentés. On procède aussi à la réouverture graduelle de l'édifice de la Cour suprême, qui était fermée au public depuis plus de deux ans. Mais tout au long de la pandémie, la Cour est demeurée à bien des, à bien des égards plus accessible que jamais. À titre d'exemple, la participation de groupes scolaires et autres à des activités de sensibilisation offertes par la Cour a permis l'an dernier à quelques 15 000 personnes de partout au Canada d'effectuer à distance une visite guidée de l'édifice. While such initiatives may not necessarily make headlines, it is important to me that Canadians have these opportunities to learn that Canada's courts are an impartial and independent pillar of Canada's democracy, one of the strongest, strongest in the world. On a final note, I wish to take this opportunity to, on behalf of my colleagues and all Canadians to thank Justice Moldaver, who will be officially retiring on September 1st, for his many years of devoted service to the court and the administration of justice. He has served Canada and Canadians with distinction and dedication leaving an indelible mark on Canada's legal system and its criminal law system in particular. Justice Moldaver's time at the Supreme Court has been a continuation of a long and remarkable career, having practiced law for nearly two decades, then served as a trial judge, and then as an appeal court judge before his appointment at the Supreme Court. Along the way, he became one of this country's most respected judges. It will be no small task to find a suitable successor. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I'm now ready to take your questions. Merci beaucoup. Maintenant, on passe aux questions. Thank you. We're uh, going to move be on one to question, questions. one follow-up. And if you think I didn't see you in the first, might not have seen you in the first time uh, around, just let me know and raise your hand. Uh, la première question, Emily Bergeron, Presse first canadienne. Question, Emily Bergeron, Presse oui, bonjour. canadienne. Uh, vous venez de parler d'un mémorandum avec l'importance de l'éducation judiciaire et l'indépendance judiciaire. Of, uh, Comment les événements de février dernier qui ont eu sur la colline parlementaire yeah. Toutes les manifestations qui ont eu, comment ça vous a influencé à aller de l'avant avec ces événements last February, the protests on Parliament Hill influenced you on this. Comment vous êtes senti à ce moment-là? 
the Chief Justice ben, moi, of such an important institution, mandat, how did you feel at that time? Answer. Well, at the beginning of my mandate, I decided that part of my goal should be to give as much information to the general public as possible, because I believe that a source of bias and prejudice is lack of information. That explains many of the initiatives that I referred to, better communication, a better ability to understand our our decisions, better communication by judges across the country in order to La confiance des gens dans leur institution. to strengthen people's confidence in their institutions. And what I noticed, what many people have noticed, in the last few years, probably because of the pandemic that accentuated this, there's a huge amount of disinformation, of bad information out there. It's especially on social media. Of course, social media has its good sides, but it also leads to issues. And disinformation, I believe, is part of the explanation of what we went through here in Ottawa last winter. Misinformation means that people who are in good faith can lose confidence in their institutions and that can lead to regrettable behavior. It simply confirms my opinion that we all have the responsibility of providing accurate information so that people can understand situations and learn more. So that's the duty of courts, but also of traditional media that follow ethics rules and allows them to do their work despite various constraints. It's also the, work, the job of elected representatives to provide accurate information. So you asked what impact it had on us, obviously, like any other residents in Ottawa, it was deplorable. For several weeks, businesses closed, people lost their jobs. Work was much harder for many people, especially for the most vulnerable. And I think this kind of situation should never happen again. We have to counter disinformation. There's a lot of uh, conversations happening about security for elected officials. How do you think your institution should be included in those discussions? And are these issues that you discussed with your American counterpart? I know you talked recently. Answer. We didn't specifically address that issue with Chief Justice Roberts. You're referring to my visit to Washington. D.C., where I met Chief Justice Roberts of the Supreme Court to prepare our visit, their, their visit next year to Montreal and Ottawa. It's a visit that happens regularly every three or four years. We have um, visits between Supreme Courts with the U.S., but also with the U.K., the Australian Supreme Court was here a few days ago. We went to visit them a few years ago. So that happens regularly. So we met. Now, we didn't specifically discuss security, but to come back to the first part of your question, it has to do with the security at the Supreme Court here in Ottawa compared to other parliamentary buildings. We know that since uh, the attack that took place on Parliament Hill a few years ago, the powers that be reassessed the security situation in the parliament, for parliamentary buildings. Unfortunately, I have the uh, impression that the uh, Supreme Court building uh, wasn't necessarily included. Uh, so I have uh, asked that the Supreme Court building uh, be included in the list of buildings to protect. It should be part of the protection zone. And I hope that the latest events that we en décembre dernier, en janvier dernier, January, vont amener les autorités à, à considérer la Cour suprême du Canada comme étant un, un immeuble quand même fondamental et important à protéger. The Supreme Court of Canada will be considered as a fundamental building to be protected. Yes, good morning. Uh, 
Uh, Good morning. Perhaps you could expand uh, on, on some of those points about uh, security and concerns. Uh, are you personally concerned about uh, the security of the court and, and of, of the members uh, given recent events? Well, you know, the environment has changed, no doubt about that. And you, you can only look, not only in Canada, but, uh, but elsewhere and very close to us, in, in a country very close to us, uh, in a so-called democracy uh, where uh, surprising events occurred also in, in January of, of uh, following the, uh, the election. So in Canada, I think we have a good, a good democracy. We have a stable uh, democracy. But still, uh, we, should, we should not ignore um, some events that uh, could create some problems for us as well. And we should not, you know, un undermine uh, the efforts to increase the security. The events in uh, Ottawa last January have shown that uh, it, was a, it could be a problem. Uh, let's hope that it will be uh, referred to as an anecdote in our history. But maybe it won't. We never know. Uh, so I think that we should take this question very seriously. I know that uh, the elected officials, I think, are taking this, this issue very seriously. So we should be mindful of that. Uh, whenever, we, uh, whenever the elected officials and the authorities are uh, you know, uh, establishing some guidelines and uh, programs, I think that uh, the Supreme Court of Canada should not be ignored. You spoke in a broader sense of, of dangers to democracy and, and attacks on institutions such as the Supreme Court. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about that and specifically what you might fear in the Canadian context. Well, I think that's uh, one of the, one of, as I mentioned, one of the pillars of, of our democracy is judicial independence. And I'm very proud of that in Canada. We were able to, throughout the years, to support and maintain this judicial independence, which is fundamental to make sure that people will continue to have faith in their institution. And when they lose faith in their institution, trouble occur. That's my fear. So that's why I think that uh, we should, you know, continue our best efforts to, to support uh, our democracy, to support ju judicial independence, to support the rule of law, l'état de droit, because that's the root of the confidence and the trust of the people. And if they don't have trust, that, that's where the problems uh, occur, even for people of good faith, the disinformation and that type of, uh, of event. So uh, that's my fear. So that's why I, I, I spare no effort in so far as my jurisdiction, our jurisdiction is concerned, to provide as much uh, transparency, as much information to the public so that they could appreciate what they have, so that they could know what they have. And if they know, I think that uh, they will support, uh, they will increase democracy, they will support the courts, they will support judicial independence because we have good institutions. Let's, let's recognize that. Uh, you know, uh, I spoke about NGI, uh, National Judicial Institute. Uh, we, we export our knowledge and expertise in terms of legal education, appointment of judges, uh, legal education, equality of genders, and so on and so forth. We were in Ukraine for so many years, and it broke my heart to, to, to learn what happened there a couple of months ago. It's terrible. So we have strong institutions. We have to protect them. And, uh, I, and, and I'm optimistic if we can do that. Marie Vastel, Le Devoir. Marie Vastel, Le Devoir. C'est allumé tout seul. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Je veux revenir sur... Vous en avez parlé un peu en réponse à mes collègues. <coughs> I'd like to come back to something uh, cette, that uh, you mentioned de ce in de la another answer, answer this danger of disinformation you also talked about it during the interview last recently, but in the semaines, crois, last few weeks, I believe there were le faible Some, pourcentage de, uh, de Canadiens qui ont confiance uh, en ce que leur dit leur very, gouvernement, leur, uh, les, les médias. Vous dites que vous avez fait cette éducation civique, une mission de votre 
poste de juge en chef de la Cour suprême. Qu'est-ce que vous voudriez voir de plus what que ce qu'on like voit en ce moment? Je comprends que vous avez parlé de, de, de il faut dire les, la bonne information, contester quand ce n'est pas la bonne information, et plus concrètement, parce que qu'est-ce que vous voudriez voir de plus de la part accurate, d'élus ou, 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 like ou d'autres pans de la société, ou qu'est-ce qui, qu qui manque qui n'est pas encore là? Society. What's missing? Ben, je pense que pour revenir à votre premier commentaire de votre, de votre question, la première partie de votre well, question au niveau du manque d'appui, euh, par exemple, de la population the lack of support on remarque quand même qu'au travers des années, c'est encore aujourd'hui, les tribunaux, et notamment la Cour suprême du Canada well, demeure encore excessivement crédible dans les, dans les yeux des citoyens canadiens. Ça, c'est vraiment incroyable. Ça, c'est un élément très, très, très important. Je comprends que dans d'autres secteurs, euh, peut-être en matière politique ou euh, politics, dans d'autres secteurs euh, qui ne other, concernent pas le judiciaire, la perception du public est très différente. That I have nothing to do with, perception. Mais en ce qui concerne le might judiciaire, on demeure quand même en haut de la liste au niveau de la crédibilité. C'est tellement important. Et je ne peux pas parler pour les autres organisations, and that's extremely important. Les I can't les, speak about other institutions, the police, elected officials, education, health. Mais But ces, tous les gens qui travaillent dans ces institutions-là ont un devoir d'être transparents. All the institutions dans leur have a duty dans leur, to transparency dans leur in their everyday work. Je ne peux pas parler pour eux. C'est à eux de décider de la manière avec Now, laquelle ils peuvent transmettre l'information, éduquer, euh, informer sur tout. Moi, je peux parler simplement de ce que l'on peut faire, share, les juges. Je can pense only speak que about depuis les dernières années, je l'ai vu au Conseil canadien de la législature, years, et en me promenant un peu partout au Canada, je pense qu'on réalise, les tribunaux, Everywhere que contrairement à ce qui était le cas il y a déjà, déjà plusieurs années, où les juges, essentiellement, restaient en arrière de leurs bureaux, Basically et, uh, stayed behind their par desks and spoke only through ne doit their pas decisions. Être sur la place publique It's still pour des the case des today. We can't Mais je pense qu'on réalise depuis les dernières années policy. que les juges peuvent et doivent expliquer aux citoyens qui ils sont. I think, despite that, judges have to explain ça, ça who the they are, what they're doing. Du, uh, je vous dirais de la modernité And that's part of transparency, de l'information qui the circule age. tant par les médias traditionnels que There's par les so médias traditionnels. Je pense que c'est une réaction qui est saine et que les, les tribunaux et surtout en ce qui media. me concerne le juge en chef du pays, je pense, en raison de mes, think, de mes fonctions. Je, uh, for je, me, je as ressens une obligation et un devoir de faire cette, euh, cette, euh, cette éducation-là et cette information-là dans, dans les meilleurs scénarios possibles. Et toujours en gardant, en possible, notre while obligation de réserve, qui a fait en sorte que justement les tribunaux, reserve, même aujourd'hui, euh, sont even encore très crédibles dans l'œil des citoyens. Ce sera un autre sujet. Euh, je voulais vous amener sur les suites de l'arrêt de Jordan. I wanted to en talk about uh, what printemps. happened uh, after vous Jordan reconnu in an interview this fall, à l'époque, le jugement vous a appréhendé une une catastrophe d'arrêt de, de procédure, euh, mais vous, vous étiez rassuré de constater qu'il n'y avait pas eu d'avalanche. Depuis, uh, on a constaté qu'il y a eu divers articles médiatiques qui, qui, qui euh, rapportent un manque criant de ressources dans les palais de justice du Québec, des causes qui sont reportées. J'ai envie de vous demander cette avalanche et cette catastrophe-là que vous appréhendiez. Est-ce qu'elle est en train de, so de se you, concrétiser? Est-ce que votre now? niveau de préoccupation a évolué? Are you as worried as you were before? Question, vous savez, parce que <coughs> à l'époque, quand l'arrêt avait Answer. été euh, rendu pour lui, alors je, because, you know, je vous répète que j'étais dissident uh, <coughs> dans l'arrêt de Jordan, justement pour les raisons que vous avez mentionnées. Uh, J'avais encore à l'esprit l'arrêt Ashcroft. Plusieurs années auparavant, on avait eu 60 000 arrêt de procédure. Another decision that had led to 60,000 stays of procedures. And of course, that is something I wanted to avoid. Now, the majority spoke, and I defended the Jordan decision. I continue to do so. That's the way courts work. We support precedent. And there was no avalanche after Jordan. Of course, there were a few stays of proceedings. And Any stay of proceeding is a stay too many. In the eyes of Canadians, it's hard to understand why you could abandon any charges against people simply for administrative reasons. It's very difficult to understand that. 
Et, uh, et depuis ce temps-là, uh, évidemment, la, la, la situation n'a pas nécessairement uh, dégénéré, mais il faut rester sur nos gardes. Parce que ce qu'on constate dans toutes les have provinces, to puis je suis plus seen familier avec ce qui se passe dans la province uh, de Québec, and I'm mostly familiar, le système or de justice, c'est vrai qu'il a été Quebec. amélioré, c'est vrai que les, suite à la Jordan, les, uh, after les principaux Jordan, acteurs comme les gouvernements The les barreaux, les avocats, etc., ont players, pris conscience de l'obligation de contribuer à limiter uh, les débats et uh, limiter, limiter les really délais et réduire les coûts. Et il reste quand même que le système de justice But est encore sous-financé. Et uh, de façon uh, inacceptable en ce qui me concerne. And in my opinion, Alors, vous avez des, vous avez des assistantes judiciaires, par exemple, des juges, là, so you have qui travaillent uh, qui travaillent à 30 000, 35 000 par judges année. Working for 30, 000 les juges n'ont pas d'aide. Judges have no support. Les moyens financiers, les ressources sont limitées. Les juges ne sont pas capables de faire leur travail parce qu'ils n'ont pas les ressources adéquates. Et évidemment, l'administration de la justice, ça rejoint les décisions provinciales. Je ne veux pas m'embarquer dans un débat politique. Je constate quand même qu'on ne donne pas aux juges tous les moyens dont ils ont besoin pour accomplir leur travail. Et ça, ça m'inquiète. Et ça, si ça engendre des rapports de dossiers, and par exemple, et je sais que ça a été le cas, delays, parce qu'il manquait de greffiers, par exemple, dans les salles d'audience, on a reporté des audiences. In, parce qu'il manquait des, in, uh, des officiers de justice, on a, on, a, on a continué des officers. audiences. Ça, c'est inacceptable. Et je pense que so les experts, en tout cas, les unacceptable. autorités vont réagir And rapidement pour éviter justement ce que vous avez, euh, avez souligné, c'est-à-dire qu'on revienne dans une, dans une période où il y aurait des arrêts de parce que les procès ne pourraient pas être complétés dans le temps dans lequel la Cour suprême euh, a statué. Alors donc, il faut, faut the vraiment rester aux aguets. Mais so je pense que to euh, les leçons de Jordan euh, the doivent être rappelées. Catherine Tunney, CBC. Right here, <laughs> a little bit short. Um, it feels as though uh, more politicians at various levels are either using Section 33 of the Charter or talking about using it. Just wondering if you wanted to offer your thoughts on the notwithstanding clause and the current kind of discourse around it. I'm sorry to disappoint you this morning, but I, I won't be able to uh, comment on that issue. You know as well as I do that... Uh, It is quite possible that uh, that issue will come to our court eventually in one way or another. So I would like to be part of the, discu of the discussion. I could try to bait you, but I'll, I'll turn to something different. <laughs> uh, wondering um, if you think your predecessor, Justice McLaughlin, should be lending her uh, title, the, the prestige of the job that you hold now, to the court in Hong Kong, given concerns about the authoritarian government there and the fact that other Western uh, justices have, have left amid those concerns? Yeah. This is a very uh, personal decision that belongs to uh, uh, former Chief Justice uh, McLaughlin. Uh, I don't have the habit of commenting of, on my uh, former colleagues' uh, post-judicial career. So I will not comment on that. I think that's a personal decision. Marie Chabot-Johnson, uh, Radio-Canada. Marie Chabot-Johnson, Radio-Canada. <laughs> Question. Hi, over here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask the same question in French without asking you to really talk about the mais dans un esprit de transparence, comme vous disiez, au niveau de l'éducation uh, uh, citoyenne, qu'est-ce que les citoyens qui nous qui vont suivre ce débat-là qui va se passer entre nos différentes instances politiques us, doivent savoir quand viendra le temps de suivre what, ce processus-là? Pourquoi on peut, peut déjà les informer par rapport à cette clause-là et de l'utilisation de l'idée de l'utilisation préemptive? Dans un sens, c'est un bon point... In a way, it's a really good idea to inform people about this. Not everybody is aware of what Section 33 means and the fact that a public authority or government can invoke that section. So whose job is it to inform the public about it? Is it up to elected officials, to the media? To teachers, the judges. I don't think it's up to judges to 
go before the public and, and give the public lessons on constitutional law. However, I think it is a good idea to provide accurate information so that they're not confused and so that there's no misinformation. As I was saying earlier, misinformation expanded wildly during the pandemic and led to all sorts of surprising and bad behavior. So it's important to provide accurate information. And as a judge, given this issue, this legal question that is going to eventually become a legal debate if it hasn't already become so, it's not appropriate for me to comment on it. Et, um, Question. Si vous, vous avez quand même fait un constat que en ce moment, you à did partout au pays, note that il manque de ressources, que ça soit des ressources humaines, des country, ressources financières, plusieurs resources, whether uh, you're talking about human resources or financial resources. Je vous rapport sur I comment améliorer la situation. Mais concrètement, qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu devrait faire comme première étape? Parce que je comprends qu'il manque de ressources humaines. Ça, il y a un certain processus de long terme. I understand there's a lack of, terme, of staff, mais à so that's terme, a long-term process. But in the short term, what could our political institutions do in terms of funding to help resolve this issue? Answer. Well, there's not a single silver bullet. It's a series of measures that have to occur the au comité same time. spécial sur la reprise and des travaux, le comité uh, uh, que j'ai mis sur pied avec le ministre de la Justice en, en 2020 au début de la pandémie. Alors, le comité, au début de justement, at the beginning of the pandemic. So the committee said, OK, we have to find a way to help the courts resume because people need access to justice. Courts closed from one day to the next, overnight, rather, and that was unacceptable. So the committee was very productive. There were people from public health. There were chief justices. There was the et là, on a échangé l'information et on se rencontre une fois par mois. Et on continue à le faire maintenant, même si la pandémie semble un peu en arrière de nous. Even if it seems like the pandemic is kind of behind us, we have to be careful. But that, but we continue to meet to see how we can improve the justice system. Ça, c'est vraiment un atout qu'on n'avait pas auparavant. That is really something wonderful that we didn't have before. So that might be one silver lining of the pandemic, I guess, that we've been able to bring these people together for the public sector and the public sector. That we've been able to bring these people together for the public sector and the public sector. That we've been able to bring these people together for the public sector and the public sector. That we've been able to bring these people together for the public sector and the public sector. That we've been able to bring these people together for the public sector. Et ça a apporté des amendements au code criminel, par exemple. Parce que moi, je soulignais dès le début, euh, écoutez, un des problèmes de l'accès à la justice, parce que les, les accusés ne peuvent pas être transportés par la justice à chaque fois qu'il y a une procédure criminelle qui est déposée. Il faut amender le code criminel. Et on a amendé le code criminel. Le Parlement a, a, a déposé des amendements. Je vous donne ça comme exemple. That, uh, Mais on a également étudié des, des projets, des politiques pour faciliter les procès par jury, par exemple. Physiquement, comment, comment recommencer les procès par jury? Ensure that trials by jury can go ahead. We were able to apply the experience of New Brunswick to another province. So the committee was able to bring together enough information and enough key players to make a difference. Le maintien de la justice. And Maintenant, la pandémie to that, we to ensure un peu en retrait. Il faut continuer ce travail-là justement pour euh, continuer à, à utiliser la technologie. Vous parlez de comment, comment résoudre les problèmes de, de délai. Ben, on ne peut pas revenir en arrière. Il va falloir qu'on continue à well, utiliser la technologie. Il faut continue qu'on continue à, à soutenir les, have to continue les initiatives dans ce sens-là. Et notre comité là, va se pencher maintenant dorénavant à regarder les nouvelles façons. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire de plus pour appuyer l'administration de la justice? Ça peut être, par exemple, justice. par l'Assemblée législative des différentes provinces et le Parlement fédéral, d'augmenter la juridique. Ça veut dire de peut-être appuyer des projets de pro bono, par exemple. Pro bono ça, veut dire, euh, ça veut dire beaucoup de choses. Ça veut dire que les juges doivent... Ça veut dire regarder nos manières de faire au niveau des tribunaux. Euh, 
changer nos règles de pratique, par exemple. Courts, Regardez la, la Cour our, suprême du Canada, là, à cause de la COVID, rules. on a changé une pratique fondamentale. Les requêtes de la commission de On en a en 400 et 600 par an. Ben, avant, c'était l'huissier qui arrivait avec le chariot Before et aussi là, euh, pandemic, à chaque semaine dans les bureaux des juges. Aujourd'hui, c'est par papers. électronique. À cause and de la now COVID, everything is done electronically. We had to change our Beaucoup way of doing things because of the pandemic. De It's much more efficient. Ça, ça va We really cut down on, on inefficiencies. Comme ça, and that's just tribunal, one example. Cours le pays Every court throughout the country had to mon, review their, uh, their ways of doing things. So that is des, one way des rôles, puis de of justice. Uh, mais ça fait partie d'une multitude, d'une mosaïque de, de mesures. The administration of justice, et, euh, but it's part of a mosaïque of measures. Donc, il n'y a pas de recette magique. So there's not Dans la any mesure où tout le monde est conscient de l'urgence de le faire. Parce que si on ne le fait pas, on we va arriver to, à des, however, des résultats catastrophiques. On ne veut pas Je pense qu'on doit tirer avantage de ce terrible crise qu'on a vécue, qu'on continue à vivre jusqu'à un certain point, pour améliorer notre sort. Mais... Euh, ça inclut tout le monde, incluant les élus. Et ça inclut tout le monde, incluant les élus officiels et les autres. Uh, thank you for taking our questions. Uh, I know that you've spoken about this before in French, but I'm hoping that you can elaborate in English a bit on your meeting last month with uh, former Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer in Washington. Did you discuss uh, in any way the implications that overturning Roe v. Wade could have on trust writ large in top courts and the security of fundamental rights? No. <laughs> uh, um, I met uh, Justice Breyer because uh, when I was visiting Washington, as you, as you uh, may know, uh, the ambassador, uh, one of our best ambassadors, uh, by, uh, by the way, uh, of Canada, um, held a dinner in my honor because I was in Washington for a few days. And, um, and she invited Justice Breyer, and she invited the uh, French-speaking uh, uh, representative of, of uh, some embassies in Washington. And Justice Breyer, as you may know, is, uh, speak French fluently, is a, is a, is a friend. And uh, he was there, and, um, and he was there for that reason. Uh, I, uh, and during, during the dinner, as I mentioned before, his phone started to ring uh, uh, in repetition, and uh, and uh, was it, I, uh, you know everybody found that very strange. He could not he could not answer the phone. But uh, going back to the hotel at that on the same night, uh, there was this breaking news uh, about this leak of the draft reasons that apparently uh, would uh, reverse um, uh, a previous previous precedent. And uh, so uh, it was a bit, uh, in a way, uh, historical, <laughs> the fact that I was there and meeting the following day with the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. But we did not discuss this, uh, this draft, uh, and, um, and I will let them, you know, resolve this issue. Uh, we don't have that problem in Canada, thankfully. Uh, we saw as well during the uh, the demonstrations in Ottawa earlier this year that there was at least one of the people who was charged, uh, their legal counsel, they had suggested that a judge hearing their case should recuse themselves on the basis that they were a liberal appointed judge. Um, do you worry that we're seeing the start here in Canada of an attempt to cast doubt or discredit the integrity of judges based on who appointed them? And what would that mean if that is happening for trust in Canadian judicial institutions? I don't think so, uh, but I think that we have to be mindful of that. Uh, I think that history has shown that we have a very impartial and independent judiciary. Uh, and uh, look at the way the, uh, the members of the Supreme Court are appointed. It's an independent uh, committee of eight people will make uh, recommendations of three to five names to the prime minister, and somebody has to decide. In our country, the prime minister will decide. In other type of appointments, it will be the justice minister following recommendation of independent board. And so it, it's, it is a very transparent uh, process. And uh, we don't have this polarization that uh, I think that even the Americans will recognize themselves uh, in the appointment of judges. That's not good. Uh, but it, it's not in our DNA. And it was never the, the case. Uh, you can have people appointed by different governments 
throughout their careers. I'm a good example. Uh, and I, I have other colleagues on the, on the bench as well. And my predecessor as well was appointed by different uh, governments. So we don't think about that, uh, but we should be careful not to, we should be mindful of that to avoid being, being uh, brought to this, uh, to this way of appointing uh, judges. So uh, I think we have, uh, we have a good system. I think, uh, I think we have a transparent system. I think that people should know who the judges are, where they come from. Uh, but uh, but that, that's, that's a one way, a good way of uh, increasing, I think, the faith and the trust uh, in the judiciary. Tonda McCharles, Toronto Star. Uh, hi. Um, I, just to follow on that point, after you were in Washington, after the leak of that uh, judgment, um, you, you're now expressing confidence that that would never happen here. But I, I'm curious, did you actually do anything after that happened in the U.S. to ensure that doesn't happen here? What did you actually do and say to the staff at the court or the uh, other judges to ensure that doesn't happen? Uh, to be very tra transparent, I, 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 I said nothing special. In other words, um, you know, there's so much you can do. Uh, at the court, uh, you know, our staff, our personnel, uh, many of them have been with the court for so many years. They are committed to the court. They know their, their task. Uh, our clerks, uh, of course, they know when they are hired that they, they sign uh, documents, confidentiality documents. Uh, there was never an incident in the past uh, regarding the, the Supreme Court of Canada. Does that mean that it could never happen in the future? Nobody can say that. But I would be very much, very much surprised because we don't have this polarization here in Canada of issues, even on very sensitive issues, uh, like in criminal code, for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, aid to uh, medical uh, medical aid to suicide, for instance. We, uh, the, uh, gay marriage, uh, name it. I mean, we had to deal with those uh, with those very sensitive issues throughout the years. We never experienced that polarization, uh, and that's the main difference. Uh, Tanda with what, what's happening in the U.S. and what happened for so many years. So that's why I'm, I'm confident that it could not happen here. Uh, talk about uh, Justice Moldaver's replacement, and um, I just wanted to understand, do you have a sense of timing for his replacement to be named? And you mentioned also about how the court doesn't want to give up some of the um, you know, abilities to work remotely and what not. So do you ever see a time when the judges of the Supreme Court would not be have, have to be based in Ottawa? No, I, I, was, I was mostly referring to the way uh, lawyers are arguing their cases before the court because... Uh, right, too, so could they ever be based outside of Ottawa and what's the timing for Moldaver's replacement? First, uh, for Justice Moldaver, I think uh, his, uh, his date of retirement is September 1st. I know for a fact that... Uh, there is a committee right now working on his, uh, on his re replacement. I am confident that we'll have a nine member uh, before September 1st. And uh, I would hope so because, uh, you know, the court is going to Quebec City on September 12th. And I want to be there with my, all, my, all of my colleagues. So um, I, I'm confident that we'll have a replacement before the end of summer. As for judges, of course, during COVID, uh, some judges have to work from home, and it worked very well. Uh, we had the technology, as you, as you may know, since the 1980s at the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, in a way, uh, and I can understand that, uh, lawyers throughout, throughout the years would, would prefer to come to Ottawa argue their cases. And I, I can appreciate and understand that lawyers arguing a case in front of the Supreme Court of Canada would like to live the experience of coming to this magnificent building. Uh, uh, but I think that because of COVID, I think that people realize more and more, and maybe the clients of those lawyers also, realize to what extent we can use, they can use technology to argue their cases. So a lawyer in Vancouver, instead of coming to Ottawa with the hotel, airplane, so on and so forth, could argue the case from his office. Um, and uh, it, would, it, would, it would not change anything. 
So that's a new reality, I think, for many people. And I would hope, if I talk about access to justice, if I talk about, if I'm mindful about cost and delays, I would hope that uh, lawyers and other parties would, would use technology to avoid. But if they could, yes, if they want to. But uh, there's, I, I, would, I would tell you, that, Tanda, that um, uh, it's hard to replace um, uh, nine judges talking to each other and seeing each other in the same room. I mean, I think that's the best, the best way to make sure that uh, every point of view is, is looked at, is considered. Uh, we would, we've done it during COVID because we had no choice, but I see a big difference between an, a lawyer arguing a case uh, virtually and judges discussing together a case. I think that we need the presence of, uh, of our colleagues. It's a collegial way of, uh, of working and that may make a difference in the outcome. Chris Nardi, National Post. Bon matin. Bon matin. Um, you mentioned earlier um, trying to bring the Supreme Court building kind of into, uh, you know, more of the purview of parliamentary protection or upping the security level of the building. Uh, can you give me a bit more detail as to what you are lacking now, what you would like more of? And also, what, what change, like, do you personally, for example, feel less in safety since events either of January of 2021 um, in the U.S. Or, or the convoy here? But what, what I mean is that uh, most recent events have shown that uh, the priority was made, was put on the parliament buildings and not so much on the, uh, on the, on the Supreme Court building. And um, so I would hope that uh, the Supreme Court building will be considered as a priority in terms of, of safety and security. That's what I meant. And, um, and you were talking earlier about the, the, the threat of disinformation, right? Misinformation, we, we hear about that a lot. Um, but a lot of, of the strategies that deal with that is instantaneity, right? Responding quickly. And, and so you've talked a lot about education going around and, and teaching people about the values and, the, uh, and the, the, the rules of the court. But when you have a wave of disinformation that may be affecting your, you know, that, that might be spreading instantly and, and quickly, um, you know, education isn't necessarily going to stop that in the future, right? So what are the court's plans, if any, to address disinformation, misinformation that might be affecting it as it happens? Is there more proactive strategies that you want to take on to address it as it happens and then prevent it in the future? Well, that's a good question, but, you know, there, there's so much you can do. <laughs> in other words, you, you know, when, when the information is in, in instantly uh, given or accessible to many people, there's so much you can do. There are limits as what you can do. I think that when I refer to education information, I think it, we're, we're, we're dealing with, with middle-term and long-term uh, result, I would say. And, you know, you start with the uh, younger generations, the young, young students, for instance, uh, and young people, and, uh, and eventually, if you provide them with the proper information, I think it will be helpful in, 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 in a few years ahead. Same for ad adult people, but we, it's hard to bring immediate results to that type of disinformation. I think it's a long process, uh, but it should be undertaken. And we should, uh, you know, one reason why um, when we go outside of Ottawa to uh, meet people, like we'll, we'll do in, in Quebec, we go and meet the students in high schools. That we did, that's what we did in, in Winnipeg, because I believe that's where we should start. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, when I was uh, appointed back in 2017-18 as a Chief Justice, uh, when uh, during the ceremony I asked that students, high school students from Quebec and Ontario, come to the, to the court to meet, to meet with me, because uh, I, I strongly believe in that, that we should start with the younger generation to provide them with the right information. So it's a long-term effort, but we have to do it. And uh, I think that uh, it's not, uh, it does not belong to one group or one person. It belongs to every responsible stakeholders in society. Pascal Vachon, TVO, TFO. 
Euh, oui, Vachon bonjour. Vous avez parlé beaucoup dans les dernières semaines de, du bilinguisme à la Cour suprême. Vous avez demandé à un juge bilingue. Je ne veux pas nécessairement revenir sur ça, mais est-ce que vous considérez que la Cour suprême, sachant qu'il y, euh, qu y a de moins en moins de francophones au Canada qui ont un déclin du français, vous considérez que la Cour suprême a un rôle à jouer pour, et le système judiciaire a un rôle à jouer pour peut-être augmenter, pour dire, refléter la francophonie canadienne, peut-être aider à ne pas avoir un déclin. Est-ce que vous sentez que votre Cour a un rôle à jouer là-dedans? La Cour suprême n'a pas un rôle politique à jouer. The Supreme Court doesn't have any political role to play. The Supreme Court does have a role to play in supporting bilingualism in the Supreme Court and also especially to ensure that francophones throughout the country recognize Alors, their institute, uh, recognize themselves de, within de the institution. So one of the objectives to have bilingualism juges, at the court in terms of staff and judges is a question of credibility and transparency so that Canadian citizens can recognize themselves within the institution. That is why Uh, for the last few years, we've always uh, uh, striven for institutions to reflect society at, at every level, Canada. and that includes Alors, the Supreme uh, Court of Canada. Canada. So I think that we're je going que, in the right direction. Uh, we have to make sure that people uh, of various backgrounds are appointed exemple, at various levels, Canada, but will never sacrifice uh, quality at the Supreme passé, Court of Canada, for example. Uh, last year, we were very à, à happy à to welcome Justice Jamal, Jamal, who uh, was et, uh, who the first la, racialized person to be appointed, but also jour, an eminent uh, un, legal un juriste, figure in Canada. Uh, and I hope that in the future, we'll also be able to welcome an indigenous jurist. So. Que ça soit évidemment un But once again, of niveau. course, it has Alors, to be uh, donc, je top de notch. Je pense que pour, uh, pour, so uh, I think to achieve question, je pense que that, to answer your question, I think the court does have a role to play. And that is why we have a new committee that I set up last year on official languages at the Supreme Court. And at the committee, we deal with ways of continuing and promoting bilingualism at the court. So we do have a role to play, but it is not a political role. But we have a role within our jurisdiction, and it's very important for the credibility of the court. Um, puis vous le savez, là, en ce moment, question? on est en train de, de, de discuter au you Parlement pour refaire right la, la, la modernisation de la loi sur le langage officiel. Je ne vais pas vous demander de vous prononcer ce débat-là plus politique, mais en général, with, um, en tant que juge de la Cour suprême, est-ce que vous voyez peut-être qu'il y a une nécessité de moderniser cette loi-là? Ça fait beaucoup d'années qu'elle est là. Vous avez beaucoup de causes qui impliquent cette loi-là. Est-ce que vous voyez une nécessité? Est-ce que vous voyez peut-être des... pas une loi 18, mais des problèmes dans cette loi-là qui ne reflètent pas la diversité qu'on dit et la francophonie canadienne aujourd'hui? reflect the realities années, of uh, francophonie today? Answer. <laughs> well, the <laughs> act is quite old, and <laughs> the decision to update it is a political decision <laughs> that, uh, that is made by elected <laughs> officials. <laughs> We deal with, uh, with cases as they pertain to the law. Uh, so it's not really up to me to answer no, that no, question. Um, Uh, first question, um, without getting into any of the specifics of the case, do you have any concerns about the fact that a Quebec judge presided over a secret trial and what that says about the administration of justice? Well, uh, that issue is, uh, is before the court, as you know. The Court of Appeal will, will eventually release a decision on the merit of that, that decision. They already issued a first decision, the same three judges, I think, and um, And I, I've said so many times, so by deference and by respect, I will not comment on that specific case. I will let the Court of Appeal decide uh, because it's under their uh, jurisdiction. But I said what they already wrote in their first decision, I would say that the open court principle in Canada is, is fundamental to uh, our democracy. That's all I said. That's all they wrote, and I think we agree, and we'll see and we'll let them work on their decision. Uh, and my uh, second question is, I just want your thoughts on where you see um, a good balance being between 
a vibrant democracy that can criticize uh, decisions from the court and judicial independence? Like, where do you see that balance? Well, there's no problem in, in, in criticizing a, a, a judgments like, uh, you know, freedom of expression. Expression is part of our charter, and uh, it should, uh, like, like our court said so many times, we have to support that. It's one great element of our democracy. Once uh, freedom of, of expression is, is attacked, uh, it's the first sign of, uh, of, uh, of tyranny, like attacking the judges and attacking the media. So uh, the question is, how should it be done? I, I don't think that um, government officials should um, uh, criticize uh, the judges. Uh, I think that they should, uh, they should act accordingly and uh, and uh, and uh, legislate if they want to and if they believe that they have to legislate in response to a, a judicial decision so it's all in the manner in which it is it is done uh, but i think that it's it's good that uh, decisions be discussed in the population that's the reason why we're going we outreach we're going this outreach activity to make sure that people understand uh, our decisions and maybe if they understand our decisions, the critics will be more positive. And since not everybody, given the pandemic and everyone's wearing masks, the gentleman in the front row with the red tie, could you please identify yourself and ask your question? Yes, Marco Bellas, Bonjour, Bellas Monsieur Monsieur Jean -Chef. Jean -Chef. du Devoir. Vous avez dit que la Cour suprême contre des fuites semblables à celles qui, donc, la Cour suprême des États-Unis a été victime en raison de la moins grande polarisation ici. From leaps like what happened in the U.S. because there's not a polarization here in Canada, but at the same time in the last few months there has been increasing polarization here so do you think it might be necessary to take any measures to reinforce strengthen the integrity of the Supreme Court? Des juges de la Cour suprême ont été rapportés au cours des derniers mois. Est-ce qu'il y a eu des failles de sécurité à la Cour suprême? Have there been any security issues or threats to judges that mean that explain why you think that the building should be included in the security plan? Answer. First of all, I, I didn't say we were completely protected. I just meant that we don't have the same polarization of ideas, of personalities, of, of, cur of thought. And that is why I said I would be very surprised for that kind of event to happen, because it's quite surprising that flaw in confidentiality that occurred when something is revealed to the general public before the official decision is handed down. It's, it's quite surprising. When it comes to security, obviously police forces do their jobs, and if ever there are threats, they are dealt with. I'm not aware of any specific threats, but of course we have to stay vigilant. And it is in that spirit that I was saying that given what we're seeing and what we're hearing in other countries very close to home, what we saw partly this winter, here I think we do have to remain vigilant. We can't just sit back and say, oh, we're fine here, it will never happen here. So we have to be careful without being alarmist. Question. The choice of your predecessor to remain at the court in Hong Kong is a personal choice, you say, but that still has a, an effect on the reputation of the Supreme Court of Canada. So do you approve of her decision to stay at that court? And have you ever discussed this with her? Answer. Uh, to answer the last part of your question, first, I've never discussed the issue with her. I met uh, former Chief Justice McLaughlin a few weeks ago, 
gentil de venir because rencontrer she was nice enough to cour, come and meet our, our clerks chat, là, at a fireside chat at uh, uh, the Supreme Court. Et je, je l'ai salué, puis on a, on a eu so uh, I greeted her on a un small talk, mais on n'a pas parlé de ça du tout. We, we did some small talk, um, but we didn't discuss that issue at all. Et comme je l'ai dit, il y a eu d'autres instances également dans le passé. Je ne commente pas As I said, les activités de l'ancien There have been other instances in the past, but I don't comment uh, on the decisions, professional decisions of the former colleagues. It's their own personal decision, and I don't comment so, on that. I'm told we're out of, ta- we're out of time. Uh, puis il y a des gens qui, ont, qui attendaient en ligne aussi. Donc je, mais je présente mes excuses à too, eux autres to ask qui, uh, qui attendent. So like to uh, merci beaucoup pour votre générosité avec votre Thank you very merci, much for your generosity si jamais, with your time. And if question. ever you do want to answer the last <laughs> question. Well, Peut-être we didn't answer any online, online questions. Si Maybe we could answer que... one. Um, yes, if, if it's okay say, <laughs> with you. Just par uh, gentillesse, okay. disons. Just out of courtesy. Okay. <laughs> the, the, course. the seule question en ligne, c'est Hélène Buzetti, uh, the Coop de l'Information. Hélène Buzetti, Coop de l'Information. Ah, Maintenant, j'apprécie votre gentillesse. Justice, uh, Wagner, uh, thank you um, for je voulais revenir answering sur cette, question. Um, cette fuite aux États-Unis I'd sur like le, le jugement. I'd like to come back to the leak in the U.S. The fact that it highlighted once again 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 which the American Supreme Court is seen as very politicized and how the person who wrote the decision has an effect on its perception. So what would you tell Canadians who think that the same pattern is happening in Canada, who might conclude, okay, now there are five judges appointed by, by Mr. Harper, Bien, so you're a conservative court, but now with a new judge being appointed by uh, the prime minister, it c'est will une, become more of a liberal court? Answer. We're talking about two vie, completely different realities, sociale, different de traditions, de lives, traditions in ne, terms of, of the law, of society. It's so, so, uh, so different. So I don't think the exercise uh, will lead to any useful conclusions. I don't think that's how we were raised, if I can put it that way. Whether you're talking about a judge, a judge, elected official, a politician, an administrator. It's not in the DNA of Canada. So you have to be careful in the U.S., from the beginning of the process for appointing judges, it's polarized. It's an aggressive process. It goes beyond the regular issues of presentation of candidates. You're talking about days of hearings where they talk about their philosophies of life. It's so contrary to the way we do things here. It wouldn't make sense to do things in Canada in that way. I think even in the U.S. they realize that, that it's really extreme. It's so divided there. You mentioned that there are five judges appointed by a certain government. But, you know, I was appointed by three different governments and my predecessor also. We recently handed down our decision on the Bissonnette case, and uh, we were unanimous in our decision, ADN, nine judges. So it's really not part of our DNA. I really ça, hope people will ces, continue to uh, seek out information on the origin of these differences, to continue to have faith, because look, look at how judges are appointed here. You have living proof of how things are independently done here. Things are done independent of a political parties here. So we have to trust judges, trust that they are independent and impartial, and the decisions that are handed down prove it. Uh, merci beaucoup. Je, je vous amène tout question. ailleurs pour ma, ma deuxième Thank you. question. And for my second question, uh, I'd like to talk about something else. Uh, plusieurs I want to talk about minimal sentences. Several of these minimal sentences were thrown out 
Euh, par contre, je constate qu'il y a comme une, évolu une évolution du But discours I autour de ça où on dit que finalement, on abolit les peines pour réduire l'incarcération des personnes noires ou des personnes autochtones ou entre guillemets racisées. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de l'évolution? Je n'étais pas dans l'impression que c'était ça uh, l'argumentaire de votre tribunal uh, pour l'abolition de des, des peines minimales. Alors, la Cour est appelée à trancher ces questions-là au fur et à mesure qu'elles sont, qu sont présentées. The court deals euh, donc, c'est chacun qui est un cas d'espèce. Et a case euh, lorsque ça vient devant basis. le tribunal, devant la Cour, bien, so, ou bien il y a une un, un contestation en vertu de la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés en disant que telle disposition va à l'encontre d'une disposition de la Charte ou non. Il y a un débat qui se Alors, ça peut être sur plusieurs niveaux. So uh, these decisions pas de can have to do de with many different levels. There's no general philosophy. Each case is dealt with. Selon les arguments juridiques qui nous sont soumis, selon la loi en question, selon la disposition en question, et on peut, on peut uh, confirmer la validation ou confirmer la légalité des dispositions légales en vertu de la charte, ou on peut on peut déclarer qu'elle est contraire so, à certaines dispositions de la Charte. On l'a fait récemment en matière de peine au niveau des, euh, de la charter. peine We pour euh, meurtriers multiples. On a, on a invalidé d'autres euh, dispositions sur la base euh, de l'article 12 également comme étant cruel et inusité. Out, uh, on a validé, validé d'autres dispositions en disant punishment. que ce n'était pas We contraire aux dispositions de la Charte qui doit être Il n'y a aucune philosophie en arrière de ça euh, politique ou autre. On regarde le dossier au cas so, par cas et je pense que justement, Hélène, case, vous, faites, euh, vous faites bien de le souligner, euh, nos décisions peuvent euh, éclairer les gens là-dessus euh, selon Sometimes la nature des points de droit qui sont soumis à la Cour, on voit des, des décisions qui sont différentes. Donc, ça, ça ne dépend pas d'un courant politique ou philosophique so, mm, comme on peut ou certains prétendent que c'est le cas, par exemple, aux États-Unis. Merci beaucoup, ça m'a fait cette conférence de presse. Merci beaucoup, Merci beaucoup. 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 Merci be